Welcome everyone and thank you for joining Autism Speaks and Navigating an Autism New Diagnosis. Uh, this webinar is the first in a series of three separate webinars that we will be conducting. Uh, and we hope that when you register for this webinar that you also register for the next two webinars and they are going to take place on January 6, uh, 2021. And the last one, part three, is going to take place on January 13th, 2021. So with the registration link, you can just click and select which ones that you'd like to attend. But we hope that you are able to attend the entire series to get the most help and resources that are available to you. My name is Janet Williams, and I will be joined by Marianne Sullivan. Uh, we are both outreach directors for Autism Speaks, but more importantly, we're also parents of sons who have an autism diagnosis. Today, I will be serving as your moderator, and we are so excited to have some of our amazing speakers on today. They will be sharing some of their experiences as well as their journeys after receiving an autism diagnosis, either for themselves or for their loved ones. Then we will introduce you to Dr. Kristen Soule. We're so glad to have her joining us on tonight. Uh, Dr. Soule is a pediatrician and she's also our keynote speaker and she'll be answering some important questions and addressing some issues that an individuals and families may face before or during the process of receiving a diagnosis. Uh, for now, I am going to turn it over to Mary Ann who will share some information about Autism Speaks mission statement and some additional information regarding tonight's program. Thank you, Mary Ann. I'll let you take it from here. Tonight's going to be very helpful, especially if you've had a child recently diagnosed. Uh, this is very focused and very targeted towards families who have had a newly diagnosed child or children. I'd like to say, uh, if you have questions please put them in the Q&A box. We will take questions at the end of uh, the PowerPoint at the, after Dr. Soul speaks. We may not get to every question. Uh, also, if you would keep your questions to broader uh, questions around the diagnosis or what to do next, We've, if you do have individual questions, feel free to put uh, your email and let us know in the chat box. We will certainly connect you with the autism response team. They are a, a group of trained uh, coordinators who will be available to answer your more specific individualized questions about your child or your loved one. So thank you for that. At Autism Speaks, we've enhance lives today and accelerate a spectrum of solutions for tomorrow. That's uh, our mission statement. It is, uh, we know that there are lots of different types of autisms. We know that there are, the spectrum is as wide as the needs. And we know that particularly in this group, uh, when we're talking about a newly diagnosed child, we're talking about really important information that we want to disseminate to families and others. As you can see here on the screen, we have five objectives, mission objectives uh, that we work on at Autism Speaks. This really informs our work and our initiatives. And today, of course, as you can see on our screen, this is a very important one right here. And this is what we're working on in today's Zoom meetings, as well as uh, the two other uh, se sessions that we will be providing as Janet mentioned. So again, Autism Speaks is enhancing lives today and accelerating a spectrum of solutions for tomorrow. Thank you again for joining us. Okay, Janet. All right, thank you so much, Mary Ann. I also wanna share the diversity, equity, access and inclusion are also an important part of our organization's culture at Autism Speaks led by our president and CEO, Angela Geiger, and our national board. So we try to include as many diverse constituents as possible uh, and just wanna make sure that we support uh, each individual um, so that they will feel comfortable in a sense of belonging and being their authentic selves. Um, now, um, we are recording this, this presentation, uh, and so the recording will be available, and you will receive a follow-up resource uh, via an email that will be in the upcoming days. 
Um, at this particular time, we're gonna jump right in and we have some wonderful panelists that are gonna be here on this evening. And we're gonna just be kind of sharing some information with them. And so I'd like to introduce and, and talk to some of them. Uh, the first person that we have available is Deidre Van Cleve, who is a longtime Autism Speaks volunteer and a former Georgia walk chair. Uh, we also have Maurice Snell, who's a volunteer and a self-advocate. We also have parents, Joe and Lauren Forney. Joe is a member of Georgia's local chapter board and his wife, Lauren, uh, has served at the Georgia Gala Committee. Um, so you may review, uh, we are putting the, the speaker's bios into the chat box, so you may review uh, their information at any time. Uh, I am going to start with Ms. Deidre. <laughs> Deidre, if you can, can you briefly share what your journey uh, of a parent was like when your oldest son, who's now 20, um, versus your journey of when your youngest son, who's nine, was diagnosed? And can you share the importance of educating yourself about autism? Yes, um, my oldest son, uh, Deshaun, he was um, basically, he was developing um, atypically. I didn't see any, anything. We were meeting all of our milestones. Um, but I did see some things while he was growing up that kind of made me, you know, just look at him and I said, well, wrote it off to, um, we all have quirks, we all have quorums, so not a big deal. There were no issues um, with talking or um, schoolwork. However, once my youngest son, Daylon, was um, two and a half, he stopped talking. And so when we went to the doctor's office and, um, uh, she saw that he was no longer uh, responding to me asking him questions, you know, typical questions of a two-year-old about what is this animal or colors. Um, that's when she kind of said, well, I think we need to send you out to the uh, Marcus Institute Autism Center here in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, she also referred us into speech and occupational therapies. Uh, because at that particular time, there was a long wait period to get into the Marcus Autism Center. So she was like, maybe some things will have panned out by your, your um, appointment. So fast forward to those six months when we got in, um, things hadn't really changed with Dalen. He was still singing, but he wasn't talking. So I, I knew the communication was there. So um, during that initial visit, when I noticed when she was asking him some certain things that I knew he knew colors. He wasn't really responding. Then he responded when she was putting the colors away really quickly. So she pulled him back out and she asked him again. And then we noticed that instead of pointing, he looked at it and then he quickly darted away. So um, other red flags popped up. And then she um, basically told us we would come back in another six months to see um, a doctor. So we were still doing our therapies during that time. So when we came back, we pretty much got our diagnosis at that point. And they gave us a folder um, that had information about Autism Speaks in there. And at that moment, I felt lost. I felt behind. I felt, um, you know, I don't even really quite understand what autism is. So as I started studying and learning about autism and learning the different, um, which say symptoms or different uh, warning signs and red flags, that's when I looked at my oldest son and I was like, okay. <laughs> We, we have something here. So at that point, I continued to um, study. And then I also realized that with the therapies, that there were different languages with each therapy, with social security, with Medicaid, with all these different avenues. So I told myself, we're going to school. So I had to sit down and really give myself a lot of time to pay attention to all these terms um, so that I wasn't just nodding and saying, yeah, okay, great. And then walking away and not understanding or not being able to ask a question that I really needed to ask. Because sometimes when you don't know what to ask, you just don't know what to ask. So yeah. um, at that point, like I said, so with Dalen, we kind of just kept moving forward with everything, you know, the therapies and going back to the Marcus Autism Center. With Deshaun, I had to then start to advocate for him because at that point he was actually 15. So I had to advocate for him as far as trying to get a diagnosis. I was pretty sure at what we were dealing with. So we had to go to a couple different therapies or different um, professionals before we got our diagnosis. Once we got that diagnosis, then I had to push for school. 
So um, for him to get the 504 plan. So then again, I had to learn those terminologies as well, 504 and IEPs. So now that he's in college, I had to learn to how to, how do I make his experience in college be comfortable for him? So now he has all the accommodations that he needs and he's very successful. That is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Yes, education is key. It's important to educate yourself and just to learn whatever you can, you know, so talk to your pediatrician, talk to someone uh, that can offer you support. And of course, reach out to Autism Speaks for additional support as well. Now, we understand that receiving the news of an autism diagnosis, uh, diagnosis it can affect individuals as well as families in many, many ways. Um, you know, some we know that may need a little support or accommodations. Uh, some may need moderate support. And then others we know may need significant support. So uh, we're grateful to have Joe and Lauren Forney here. Um, and they have, want to share some information about the strong support system that they have, but they also recognize, you know, that there are others um, that, you know, after receiving a diagnosis, either for themselves or for a child or a family member, they may feel isolated, and so their needs can vary. Um, Joe and Lauren, um, I'm just going to turn it over to you so you can share some tips on the importance of connecting and finding support and what to do if you can't. Absolutely. Um, well, I'll start by saying that it definitely takes a village. Um, you'll want to get as much help as you can. Um, for us, it was spending as much time as we could with family. The more time we spent with them, the more they knew and understood our child. Um, and ultimately, you know, how, making them better able to help, um, which you will need. Um, it's important to have that respite. We all need a break now and then. Um, it's also nice to take advice from professionals such as therapists. They can offer a great deal of advice and techniques um, that you can incorporate at home and pass along to your family as well so that everyone is working together using the same techniques and um, on the same page and working together, which um, also makes the child feel more comfortable because with autism, we all know routines are very important. So keeping that routine cons consistent at home and with family um, is key. And um, going back to taking advice from professionals, we've even had family members attend some of the therapy sessions with our son, um, just so they can also see it in person, you know, what he does and um, how the therapists work with him. So also educating them as much as possible. Um, a lot of times family members just don't have much knowledge or experience with autism and therefore don't understand it or feel like they can help. Um, Autism Speaks has a great number of resources that you can utilize, articles, toolkits, and even webinars like this. Um, you know, send them those pamphlets, um, invite them to attend these webinars with you. And again, just the more they know and see, the better able they are to help and provide that support you need. Um, lastly, show your appreciation for any effort made by your family so that they feel confident in what they're doing and also encouraged to um, do more. And, um, and if all else fails and you can't get the support you need from your family, um, don't be discouraged. There are other avenues. Um, there are many other families within your community um, who understand what you're going through. Um, the, Obviously, your local autism chapter can help you find a local support group. Um, I, in my personal experience, I've also found that um, Facebook is a great place to search. Um, there's a lot of support groups locally um, where parents can share tips and um, qu ask questions and just, you know, even provide so opportunity for social gatherings. Um, so... <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'll add some points too, and great articulation by Lauren, but, you know, most importantly, when you receive this diagnosis and, you know, you feel like the world's against you and it's really not, you need to embrace uh, the diagnosis and, and move forward with it. At first, you know, when I'll talk from a real world experience, when I received the diagnosis, I thought it was, I knew something was wrong. 
but I didn't want to admit that something was wrong, right? So I, I tried to hide in a shell, right? But I, what I recommend to everybody out there, when we talk about support, Lauren said it takes a village. It truly does. Talk about it to your coworkers. Talk about it to your friends. Talk about it to your family. Don't hide in a shell. Go out and continue your normal day-to-day -day activities. Go to Target. And, you know, people ask, talk about autism. That's how we get the acceptance and the inclusion, and we build this community even stronger day by day. Uh, what did I also do to embrace it? I, I challenge everyone to get involved in your local chapter. We moved to Atlanta uh, for a relocation when I was with Verizon Wireless. We didn't know anybody except some fraternity brothers and some people from college at the University of Tennessee, but we embraced that right? We embraced having them over, getting them to know Peyton, getting to understand his, uh, you know, his, his different quirks about him, right? Then that's the most important thing. Don't hide in a shell. Be proud to know that your, your, your loved one has this diagnosis and take that momentum into the world and, and educate the others. But I would challenge everybody with this to, to make sure that you invite others in and don't push them away because they're your most valuable resources, your friends, your family, your coworkers, your therapists, your teachers, everybody, because it truly does take a community uh, to, to love and raise somebody with autism. Well, thank you both so much for sharing that. Uh, and it's so important. And, and I heard you, Lauren, talk about Facebook. And, and in, uh, later in this program, I'm going to be sharing an exciting resource that was just released on today. Um, so uh, our next guest is Maurice Snell. Uh, Maurice, who I'm sure don't mind me sharing, uh, is a person who has an autism diagnosis. And Maurice, thank you so much for being here. And I would just love for you to briefly talk about your journey as an autistic person, uh, you know, the importance of advocacy and what you think is important for new diagnosed families to know. So I'll let you take it from here, Maurice. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jadine. Thank you and Autistic Speaks for inviting me to this webinar presentation. Um, a little briefly about myself. Uh, I started out um, as a young individual ba baby um, who was filled with joy, full of life. Um, it was then until my parents, something was abnormal with me. They didn't, they didn't think anything was right with me. So I all of a sudden stopped making noises, make it, stopped talking, or I didn't have the urge to talk back then. So my parents took me to many different specialists and they didn't know what they would do with me. And then it was one therapist after that they didn't have any answers, but it was then they found like a therapeutic program that they were, they were willing to accommodate me. And, and there, there I was, I was placed in the therapeutic program where I slowly tried to fit in with the other individuals of the same diagnosis. Um, it was frustrating at first. I was lost, didn't have a ways to succeed back then, but I had the encouragement of teachers, teachers and therapists that got me along the way. So therapists um, and other teachers that have encouraged me to continue to keep going, keep at this, um, you're getting this, you will do better in no time. And uh, I'm grateful to have managed to get all these tips from them, most especially my colleague, Colleen Shen, who I'm known for like 23 years now. So me and Colleen, we go back, back when she was like a teacher's aide back at the school where I used to attend. And now we've been keeping in touch with each other for quite a while and I'm grateful to have such a colleague and a wonderful friend such as Colleen. She has encouraged me to do all the things that I didn't anticipate on doing later in life, um, which is after graduating from Easter Seals or transitioning from Easter Seals to a regular public high school, I went to Benito Warriors Community Academy in Chicago and then after high school, I went to St. Xavier University in Southwest Chicago. So um, Easter Seals helped me to become independent and more socially academic. And I'm grateful that they have given me the tools to succeed and mentor through life. 
So this is where I am. I'm 37 years old. I'm back at the place where I once started. Now I get to encourage families of individuals with autism to follow in my footsteps. Um, they had they can struggle for quite some, but continue to give them the love and support. And uh, that goes for like um, today's like families, families of autism speaks. If you have a child diagnosed with autism, um, I would not stop giving love to them. Don't ever stop giving your love to them. Continue to love them for who they are and always be patient with them. Be patient. They may not become a genius overnight. Um, it takes some time for them to develop either socially or mentally. Um, just have patience with them and they will, they will turn out like me later in life. So that's what my hope is for all the families. I wish them all. And if I'm a helping hand to like some of the families, I can be. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me along the way. So I want to thank Janet and everybody else for inviting me to this wonderful presentation. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Maurice. That was so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, to all of our amazing panelists, you guys were just simply amazing. And thank you for sharing your journeys and your stories with us. And, um, you know, I hope that something that was shared from our, um, you know, guest speakers today will increase your knowledge and, you know, provide you with some tips as you begin your own journey. I have a plaque in my home um, that I treasure and it says autism is a journey that we didn't plan on, but we sure do love our tour guide. Uh, and, and that is so relevant, you know, to all of us um, that are a part of these panels and, you know, just providing support and resources. So we thank each and every one of you. Um, what we're gonna do at this time is that we're going to introduce our keynote speaker. I know that some of you have questions. We're gonna save our questions to the end of the presentation. Um, but at this time, uh, I want to introduce you to our keynote speaker for today. Her name is Dr. Kristen Soul. Uh, Dr. Soul, she is a professional of clinical child health at the University of Missouri, and she's also the executive director of Echo Autism. Um, Dr. Soul is a pediatrician who has extensive experience in medical diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of children with autism. Uh, and neurodevelopmental disorders. So uh, Dr. So, we welcome you. And at this time, we will turn it over to you to share uh, some important information with us that I'm sure our um, attendees will appreciate. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and wow, what a fantastic panel we all just got to hear from. Maurice, you are inspiring, but all of you, you know, getting to hear about Deidre and her children and Lauren and um, Peyton, uh, so Lauren and Joe's child, Peyton, what a great opportunity to hear from you all. So thankful to be here tonight. And so my job tonight is to talk a little bit about autism and give you all a little bit of information and then also be able to ask um, or answer some of your questions. So thank you again for having me. So when we think about autism, I always really like to make sure everyone is on the same page. Like you heard Deidre saying and some others saying, you know, sometimes when you enter into this world of autism, there's a lot of assumptions that are made that you that uh, professionals may think you know what autism is and you might not. And why would you, right? So sadly, um, many times those assumptions lead down the path of, of um, some, some fear and some additional worries that with a little bit of understanding can go a long way in helping through some of those things. So I always like to start with just understanding what is the estimated prevalence of autism in the United States. So the Centers for Disease Control have been studying the prevalence of autism for quite a long time. This visual image that we have here is just one that goes back to 2004 um, and looks at the actual study that's been going on since about that time. And certainly I can understand that as you look at this, you may be asking yourself, my goodness, you know, that has been going up quite a bit. Now, this is um, certainly something that has been studied by researchers like myself, as well as many other researchers that are part of Autism Speaks and many other organizations trying to better understand why is there this increase in prevalence. 
I can assure you that a lot of it has to do with better diagnosis. We better understand autism much, much better than we did in the um, 90s, in the 80s and the 90s, which I know that doesn't seem like that was long, that long ago, at least it doesn't to me, um, but to, uh, to in the space of autism, honestly, it is actually um, light years ago because we've learned a lot about autism in the last couple of decades. And so it's important to understand that. Our most recent numbers came out right when the pandemic hit. So you may not have even realized that brand new numbers came out right around March, 2020. And so the most recent estimate of the prevalence of autism is one in 54. This puts us right around 2% of the population having an autism spectrum disorder. And so certainly that means there are a lot of kiddos that have autism or a lot of people that have autism. Next slide. And so when we start thinking about what autism is, it's really important to understand what that looks like. You're gonna hear a lot of things about red flags for autism. You're gonna hear a lot of information about well, what exactly is autism. And so I wanna help everyone to kind of understand that autism is a big spectrum. When you think about what exactly does that word spectrum mean? Well, that means it can look very different from one child, one individual to the next. I'm a pediatrician by training. So kind of everybody, even people who are in their nineties are children. So when I say child, please don't take offense to that. That's just what I, that's the land I live in. Um, but when we think about autism, that spectrum encompasses a broad range of skills and abilities and all kinds of different things. And even within one child, we can see a lot of variation in their, um, their abilities as well as their presentation of autism. So the red flags that we often think about are most common in this, what I think of as a bucket of social communication. This is really the hallmark of autism. So when we think about autism, Social communication means things that we do in order to interact with other human beings. So things like using gestures, we use our hands to communicate, pointing, showing, sharing our facial expressions, things that we use that are really not words, but our expressions um, are again, nonverbal is a word that we often use in the professional, uh, professional space to express ourselves towards another person. And so in autism, there are usually varying, or there are varying degrees of deficits. So we're often looking for things that are not present, which can make uh, diagnosing or recognizing autism a little bit more challenging. And then the other category are repetitive and restricted behaviors. These are the things we can see. These are things like maybe some hand flapping or body rocking or lining up of toys. These are often the red flags that people will comment on um, that are often more present in the toddler years or the preschool years. But there are many other examples. So for example, some individuals with autism may get very interested in particular areas of interest that seem unusual to others, but may be very functional for them or may be very interesting to that person. I have the pleasure of taking care of many, many children and adolescents and now young adults on the autism spectrum. And that is actually one of my most favorite things is getting to hear about their interests. They've taught me so many things about so many topics and it's a really exciting part of the work that I get to do. So I love that peace and that individuality that autism brings um, to our communities and to our families. And so certainly I think that's a, a, an incredible role. But when your child or your loved one is diagnosed with autism, this is what we're really looking at. And there's of course lots of criteria that goes into this, but I wanted you to get a good overview of, it's really about deficits or lack of um, social communication and interaction. So not necessarily just words, but how you're interacting and then the presence of repetitive and restricted behaviors. Next slide. So now what I really wanna um, impress upon everyone here tonight though, is that it is much more than just autism. So those categories I just showed you are the diagnostic kind of categorization around autism. And, and again, there's more detail behind that. And so those of us who make autism diagnoses have a lot of criteria that we look at and, and various behaviors and go to school for a long, long time um, to be able to make those diagnoses. But that is just a part of what we're looking at. And so when we make an autism diagnosis, that's fine. But your child is an entire human being. All of us are human beings, right? So we also know and what we've learned a lot about in um, in the, the research space, both again, through the Autism Treatment Network, which is part of the Autism Speaks portfolio, as well as many other research uh, researchers around the world, we now know much more about what goes hand in hand with an autism diagnosis. We know that individuals with autism experience anxiety at a much more, um, at a higher rate. We also know that aggression and sleep problems and seizures and you know constipation and various things are more common in individuals with autism than the general population. And so those are important things for us to understand. 
one of the things as a medical doctor that I know is that when you're not feeling well, that is definitely going to have a direct impact on your behavior and can also have a direct impact on your ability to develop and learn. So it's very important for us not to just look at the autism specific symptoms and autism specific criteria, but to look at that total child and total person. So we, we like to think of that as whole child, uh, whole child care or whole person care. And so certainly very important for us to understand. And again, you know, when we look across the, the total spectrum, if you will, um, of autism, we know a lot more today than we did even 10, 10 years ago. 15 years ago about autism and all of the other um, confounding factors or co-occurring factors that affect an individual with autism and their family. Next slide. So one of the things I heard as I was listening to our great panelists today really talk about the importance of not doing this alone. And so I'm going to talk to you about family-centered care. This is something that uh, those of us who practice in the autism profession, which includes other developmental disabilities, so we call it developmental behavioral pediatrics or neurodevelopmental disabilities, uh, but this practice of family-centered care is really important. And so when you're embarking into this journey, which I loved Janet's comment about, you know, um, the tour guide. I love that. I think that is a really wonderful way to think about this. But you're looking for key allies, key partners who can be with you on this journey, who are going to be there to help support you along the way. That should include professionals, and I'll touch on that in a minute, but it's also going to include key family members, key resources in the educational space. Maybe it's your daycare providers, whatever that, that may look like. But family-centered care, you are the driver of that care. That does not mean you have to be the only driver of that care. You should have a team. And so looking into this team-based care and really figuring out how do you build your team? How do you make sure that your child is getting the best care that they can? Of course, oftentimes it does start with that early identification and that diagnosis, but it doesn't end there. So I often, you know, um, I'm a, you just saw that I'm a professor of medicine. And so one of the things that I do a lot of is teach other um, medical professionals, medical students, residents, fellows, and then other, other pediatricians and um, other types of physicians and, and healthcare professionals, you know, and I think a lot of times people misunderstand that autism starts and sometimes stops with the diagnosis, but it doesn't, right? The diagnosis is one small snapshot in that child's life. And I know all of you who um, have just started this journey may feel like the diagnosis is a very pivotal day, and it is. And yet you have a journey ahead that is going to be filled with lovely, amazing ups and downs and lots of variability that is going to be just as rich in your life as it would with any of our lives who have children, right? I have a couple of children and I don't know from one day to the next what they're going to surprise me with just like your child is going to do for you in your life. And so certainly as we go through this, it's important to understand that the importance of longitudinal care. So what does that mean? That means continuous care, that you have a team that's going to be there with you. So we often are looking to make sure that families are connected to either a pediatrician, a family physician, a nurse practitioner, or a developmental pediatrician specialist, someone who's going to walk with you through this process. You know, that can be something that is not always in your neck of the woods, as I like to say. You may have someone that's right there in your community, or you may have to travel a little bit of a ways, but those are certainly uh, key factors to the team that you build um, and the resources that you're looking for. Why? Because you want somebody who's going to help you make decisions. Long ago, when, you know, when medicine was first, uh, I guess not first around, but, you know, kind of the history of medicine, the doctor's job was really to make decisions for you. But that is not the way medicine should be practiced now. Medicine now is about helping to inform you about what choices there are, helping to guide you to what is supportive of your family's values and where you see your child headed. And by the way, when that child is old enough to help support their own decision making, which in my mind, depending on the child, is around the age of eight or so, sometimes younger, depends on um, that kiddo and how they're, uh, you know, how they're engaged in the process. I'm a big believer in and helping develop self-advocacy skills in my patients. And so you want somebody who's going to walk you through, you know, what are the decisions at hand? Do I want to think about a medicine or not? That's not consistent with my family values. And so how do we think about this? Or, you know, man, here we are with a risk benefit situation that we have to think about now. And so thinking about those shared decisions and offering decision support. These are really critical concepts that I could give you a whole entire talk on, so I won't today. But these families 
self-centered care principles are really important. And so finding those people on your team to support and guide you through that is really, really pivotal to your journey. Next slide. And so I want to impress upon you that is, and I heard this thread from all of our panelists as well, it's important to take action, right? You all are here because you're taking action. Your very presence today is an action that you are taking for either yourself or someone that you love. And so you are, you are taking that action to learn more. So here are a couple of, of suggestions that I would encourage you to consider taking. Building uh, trusted professional partnerships, again, whether that be in education with your teachers um, or with your therapist or with your medical professionals or all of the above, right? Your child is going to be well served when you have trusted partnership with those, with those professionals. You won't always see eye to eye and that's okay. But when you keep those lines of communication open and when you continue to build those relationships, that's when you can really build uh, those partnerships for your child. Connect with others. You heard our great panelists talking about that. It isn't easy uh, sometimes to share, and yet it's very important. I can tell you that I've walked this journey with many, many hundreds of families, and it is a great joy. And yet I also see the grief, and I also know that it can be challenging. But I can tell you, and I can assure you, that the more that you are able to connect with others that have similar experiences, the more that that can be uh, serving to you and to other families. The more you're able to share, the more others are able to learn, not only from you, but you from them. And that also helps the community because guess what we have incredible people in our community the more the story for Maurice I am just inspired and I also can share with you that I have so many stories of what is possible with autism many more stories of what's possible than what's not possible and so I want to remind you that even though there are definite moments of grief and there are definite moments where you might think oh my goodness, um, this is really hard. There are gonna be those moments, but when you have these partnerships and when you have those connections, that is when you can really um, continue to move forward on this road um, with your little tour guide. That again, thank you, Janet, for that wonderful example. I also wanna encourage you to seek knowledge to understand. This is really important and it is important to become a consumer of good knowledge. There is a lot of knowledge out there. I think this pandemic has taught us that there is a lot of information out there, but not all information is good information. And so it's important to learn how to find good information, how to find reputable information, and then how to digest or learn from that information. And how does that map onto what is important to you and to your family? And I'll share a little bit more about that in a minute. And then I also wanna encourage you as you continue to grow in this process to share information so that others can continue to learn. One of the most important things that I can tell you that's really accelerated the understanding of autism in the last couple of decades is our ability to learn from people with autism. And so it's really pivotal for us. You may hear the word research and really, really uh, re, uh, recoil from that and think, ah, ah, no way, I don't wanna participate in that. Or you may think, yes, sign me up, I wanna help others. Whatever your initial response is, I wanna encourage you to continue to share or to, to engage in sharing information. That's how we learn and that's how we continue to grow and build upon the information that we have and can continue to support people in our community. So really important things. So I wanna highlight a couple of things. I've been a part of the Autism Treatment Network, which is, is supported by, the, uh, by Autism Speaks for the better part of the last 12 to 13 years. It has been an incredible opportunity to not only build the toolkits that some of you have referenced, um, I've been an author on many of them as well as a partner in helping to support the, the creation of those toolkits and the dissemination of those, but we also have been very much the leader in developing a lot of the evidence behind understanding the medical conditions and the psych psychiatric you know, conditions that go hand in hand with autism and greatly impact the quality of life of individuals on the spectrum. Again, I talked to you about those core issues issues related to the diagnosis. But when you talk to individuals with autism and their families, it's often the anxiety, the ADHD, the seizures, the constipation, the sleep problems that really are at the root of quality of life. And so we know uh, within the Autism Treatment Network, again, Autism Speaks, that when we can really manage those issues, quality of life often improves. And that's really what matters to us. And so it, we find that very important. And then I'm also very proud that after being a part of that network, and, and I continue to be a part of that network, we decided that we weren't making quick enough dissemination of that information. And we knew that many families had pediatricians, family physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants in their home communities that didn't know enough 
about autism. And when you turned to them, asking them, you know, your questions, they didn't necessarily have the answers in order to support you right where you were. So I designed and created um, and founded something called Echo Autism, very much built on all of Autism Speaks great work. And now we are partnered in that great work to disseminate Autism Speaks as great tools and continue to build more tools. And so I've put a QR code here. You can click on that with your phone. All you have to do is put your little camera up there and it'll take you straight to our website. But it's integrated very nicely with all the work that we've continued to do. But it's empowering professionals to better understand autism so that they too can better support you and families in the community. The thing that I'm passionate about is rural and underserved healthcare. And I know that even though I am at an academic medical center, most of my families have to drive anywhere from 60 to 120 to 240 miles to see me. And that's not really conducive to equitable care. And I really want to make it so that no matter where you live in the US or worldwide, that you have access to best practice autism care so that you can get the care that you need to take the best care of your child or your loved one or yourself if you have an autism diagnosis. And so certainly we, um, with Autism Speaks, are building repositories for the best information so that you don't have to go hunting down what you think is reputable information. And then again, we are rapidly disseminating great knowledge and training um, and partnering with local physicians, local therapists, local teachers, local psychiatrists, um, local parents, on and on and on, building quickly so that we can get this information and these shared knowledge networks out there. And again, as we learn, you learn, and we all build these networks together. And so it's a really important opportunity that we hope you will take part in. We would love to have you learn with us um, and certainly are so thankful to Autism Speaks and that continued partnership to just continue to grow and really encourage you um, to take very seriously this, this piece of taking action. Again, thank you tonight for your time tonight and taking action for being here and learning more. There's always more to learn. I learned something I always like to say, it's not just every day. I think I learn something every hour. Certainly when I'm in clinic, um, I'm learning from my patients all the time. And so I thank you for learning um, and teaching us as professionals and allowing us to take care of your um, loved one. And certainly appreciate the time to be here today and for Autism Speaks and really making sure that we are part of the community together, professionals, parents, uh, individuals with autism. Um, it's very, very important for us to be out here and then also advocating so that no, no matter where we are in this network of, of a community, that we are making sure that our individuals on the spectrum and all of us who love and care for them are working together to make a difference in, in our uh, community. So thank you. Those are the end of my prepared, uh, prepared comments, but I'm certainly prepared to help answer questions for all of you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. So. Uh, we just appreciate you sharing your uh, knowledge and your expertise with us. And also, you know, Echo Autism, they, you know, provide mentorship for a range of specialists. And we're so appreciative for that and helping to build capacity to support all individuals uh, with autism at all ages. So thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, earlier, I shared um, that I had some excited news to share uh, with you all. And this is, you know, hot off the press, just launched on today. We have a brand new Facebook group uh, to help keep these conversations going because we know that they're very, very important. And it is our new closed Facebook group called Navigating a New Autism Diagnosis. So we want to encourage you um, to please join. Um, and members can use the space uh, to connect with one another, share experiences, find tools, resources, and to help create a strong support network uh, with others in your community as well as your family. So um, please um, you know, join our closed Facebook group called Navigating a New Autism Diagnosis uh, and Autism Speaks Community. So we are excited about that. Uh, if uh, at uh, any time- Janet, I just wanted to mention. Oh, hi, Janet, it's Marianne. Uh, did we get hi. that link into the uh, chat box? Yes. So the link uh, to the uh, new Facebook group uh, is going to be in the chat box. I believe Colleen is actually putting that link in the chat box. So uh, feel free to click, click that link so that you can. But if you go to facebook.com or your Facebook page, just in the search bar, just put in navigating a new autism diagnosis, um, you know, you should be able to pull it up. But the link is certainly uh, in the chat box. So thank you so much for that, Marianne. Okay. Uh, and if at any time, you know, you find that you need support, 
uh, additional support even beyond what we provided here um, on this evening because we know that there's no way that we can answer you know everyone's question. We encourage you to reach out to our autism response team. Mary Ann highlighted them earlier. Um, they are a group of you know trained employees at Autism Speaks. Um, they are dedicated to answering questions in both in English and in Spanish. So we encourage you you know, to reach out to them with any questions um, or resources that you may need. Uh, you can call them or you can email them at help at autismspeaks.org. So if you don't remember anything else tonight, please remember that, um, that they are there and available to help you and help you navigate our website, help you find resources and tools. Thank you to Dr. Soul and Echo Autism for um, the two kits, a lot of the two kits that we have available, we now have some one pagers available as well to kind of condense the information um, that are in the two kits, you know, to help those that may, may need some additional support. So thank you, thank you, thank you to each of you. At this time, we're going to answer, um, you know, ask a few, uh, see if we can get to some questions and uh, ask a few questions. Um, you know, Colleen, Marianne, are there any questions in the chat box um, that we can direct to our our speakers and uh, keynote for tonight. Yes, we have an interesting question. I think um, how important is diet? Is limiting sugar encouraged? Dr. Scholl, do you want to take that one? Sure, I'd be happy to. So that's a great question. And, you know, here's what we know. So there's actually been some great studies looking at the impact of diet on behavior, um, as well as autism specific symptoms. So those core autism symptoms of social communication, as well as repetitive behaviors. And so we know that limiting specific food groups, including sugar, which isn't a food group, but it's a type of food, um, carbohydrate, that um, that actually does not impact your child's um, underlying autism symptoms. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that you might see some improvements in your child's behavior if you reduce caffeine or if your child is drinking caffeinated beverages or if your particular child is sensitive to sugary substances? Uh, you know, um, some kids have more hyper behavior with certain different, you know, different foods. Those are individual um, changes that you may notice in your child, but when we do their research, so the evidence, when we're building the evidence and actually looking at that, it does not, um, it does not show in the research. So it's important to understand what the research shows. Here's what I tell my families. When you're looking at um, diets and trying to decide whether it's something you should explore as a family, um, it's important to think about cost. It's important to think about what it is you're hoping to gain from something. So I always encourage families to think, okay, if I'm going to eliminate sugar, um, here's what I hope it does. I hope to see less, um, we'll just pick something, less um, hyperactive behavior, which I'm going to call, you know, this, this would be as a parent, um, I'm going to call getting up and down from the couch during, I don't know school time, I don't know, something like that. Sorry, it's virtual time. So they're at school on the couch. Um, and so, um, you know, and then I'm going to kind of keep track of that. And I'm going to see like, all right, before when we had sugar, this is what happened. And then after this is what happened. So I'm going to kind of try to keep track of, is it making a difference or not? What I see happen a lot with families, because everybody wants to try to do something. So this applies to all the somethings out there, diets, all kinds of, of different things um, that people try to try to make symptoms better. Uh, is that they try something but don't necessarily know what they're hoping will happen. And so then nobody really knows if anything's better. Um, and then before you know it, you're on, you know, 10 different supplements and three different diets and, and it's kind of ends up being a, a hodgepodge and nobody's real sure what's working and what's not working. So my suggestion is to work with your doctor, um, a knowledgeable doctor who can really help guide you through those things. Take home messages, non-sugar or reduced sugar diets do not um, are not evidence-based improvements and don't show evidence-based improvement in autism symptoms. Thank you. The next question, I think this is very important because this relates to COVID-19 and how people are managing during these really challenging times. Do you have any tips about managing autism during the isolation of COVID? Our daughter was diagnosed this summer in part her symptoms became more noticeable due to social isolation. So maybe one of the family members or individuals with autism can speak to that. Lauren, uh, would you like to respond? Oh, there she is, okay. 
Yeah, can you just uh, repeat the question one more time? Sure, it's about COVID-19 and had, you know, any tips on managing autism, quote, uh, during the isolation of COVID? Uh, their daughter was diagnosed this summer in part because the symptoms became more noticeable due to social isolation. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the pandemic has been tough on everybody, right? And especially special needs individuals and families have um, felt the impact of the pandemic, I think, a little bit in greater detail, right? So, um, you know, my world's been turned upside down, so I can't even imagine what my son's life has been since, you know, we've had to isolate, no more therapies, no more going to the parks, no more going to school, no more going to teachers. So what I would recommend is embrace what you can and control what you can control, right? So give your child a routine and give them that routine as best as you can, whether that's bringing in-home therapy if you can, or even virtual therapy if you can. Right now, a lot of healthcare companies are allowing speech therapies to continue in a virtual type telemedicine uh, setting. So I would recommend talking to your insurance provider, talking to your state, talking to your local resources, trying to see what you can do to set up a game plan, right? Especially if you have a new diagnosis during this time, try to structure out the day for your child, just like you were if you were going to, to school, to work, to anything like that. Um, but that would be my best recommendations is leverage the tools you have during this challenging time and then get a game plan to when that, you know, vaccine comes out or you can get back to quote unquote normal, what that game plan is going to look like as well too. So you are prepared uh, to go back into school, to go back into therapies and uh, attack it, you know, head on. Thank you. That's, that's really good advice. Deidre, I'm going to ask you to answer this one. My son was recently diagnosed and is 13. He is somewhat embarrassed by the diagnosis. He will be starting therapy next week. Any suggestions to help him overcome embarrassment? Um, that's a really good question because I kind of was dealing with that with my older son, um, especially when he got to college. So my first thing is to say um, what I had to kind of tell him was, first off, it's your business. It's private. If you don't want to share your diagnosis, you don't have to share your diagnosis. So because sometimes you feel like, because he told me, sometimes I feel like people, as soon as I do something, they want to blame autism or want to blame something on that's why this is. And it may, and it really may not be the case. So if he knows that um, I don't have to tell you that you can get to know me for who I am. Or like I also tried to do things where I helped him understand how he may be perceived by other individuals. So for instance, um, the way my son kind of talks, it kind of comes off a little rough and somebody may not know how to receive that. So I kept telling him that and I said, well, they may say these things to you. And once he got to school, that pretty much happened. And then he, his response was, you know what? My mom told me that I didn't mean to come off that way. So if you just let me know if I'm sounding rough or sounding mean, let me know that because I'm not aware. Sure. So, um, and then I also kind of had to sit him down and say, so look at your younger brother. We know he has autism. And before we had your diagnosis, was your brother different? Is he, you know, like you say an alien? I mean, because, you know, you have to kind of gear it to the age. And, and he was like, no. And I said, so you still love him. You still, he's just him. He just has autism. So trying to get him to be okay and embrace it himself and to understand that's just a small piece of you. That's what is going to help us know how to help you be a better you or to, um, fulfill your greatest potential. So it's not who you really are. You are you, you know, and, and everybody has, like I said earlier, quirks and qualms and no one is out here perfect. We all try to dress up and make it seem that way, but um, no one is perfect. So, you know, just, you know, be yourself and the right people, the right friends will find you. You will always meet your people. So mm -hmm. I really Thank hope you. that helps. Very good. Uh, Dr. Uh, so can you elaborate on that a little bit, if you don't mind? Yeah, so I think that it's, um, you know, it's it's pretty common um, for, for individuals to, um, 
be a little bit apprehensive about whether they want to share that diagnosis. I think the way that Deidre just described it is great. I love how you've supported your son. I think everything you just described as far as how you've been supporting him and then also how he's responded is a great way to handle that. Um, I will share with you that um, one of the things that I would encourage families not to do is keep it from your child. And so this is who they are. And I, I um, in my role, I'm often asked by families to be the one to tell the child about their diagnosis. And that's fine. Like, so my personality is very open and, and <laughs> I have no problem talking about pretty much anything. And so um, I don't have a problem with that. And yet, you know, I would ask you as a parent, you know, and you being any of you and, and any parent, you know, what does that say to your child if you're not able to have a conversation with them about them, right? And so this is, and so when I, and I'll share with you how I talk to kids about this, you know, I'm like, hey, listen, here's the deal, right? And these are, these are kiddos that have more language, right? And so um, it, it does take on a different flair if we're having it and it's, um, if it's a kiddo that has a little bit less language. But certainly we'll talk about things that, you know, I have blonde hair, you have brown hair. Um, I like to talk a lot. You don't talk as much as I do. And of course, then everybody laughs because they all know how much I talk. Um, and so <laughs> we just talk about how everybody's unique. And, and that's what makes our world go round. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and then I'll, you know, again, depending kind of on the kid, on the person, sometimes I'll go into saying, and in our society, so again, this is kind of for my really higher level, like, so those that will humor me a bit, um, I'll say, you know, in our society, we have, we, um, we tend to uh, favor those who are more outgoing, who are more talkative, things like that. And, and we have named things uh, that are not as those as the, as such, right? So I remember having a conversation with a young man one time. Um, and cause I was giggling about the fact that like, I mean, I could probably have a talkative diagnosis if I were in a different planet and that was considered completely abnormal, right? Which could be. Um, and so when we think about it, right, it's really a constructed thing. Um, and so certainly the little kiddos that are needing early intervention, so hear me out, right? I'm talking about the, the notion of us. We're all we all have our uniquenesses. We all have contributions to what we do. And so I'm by no means minimizing the fact that we do need to intervene. We do need to address early intervention. We do need to make sure that we are helping them succeed in academics and all of these things. And yet that doesn't mean, and this is a phrase I am very known for saying, it does not mean they're broken. So they are not broken. And so that's something that I really emphasize to families is that they are who they are and we meet them where they are. We support them to grow and to develop into who they are. And yet at the same time, we need to recognize and, and um, support them for who they are. And so anyway, Deidre, I think you're doing a phenomenal job with how you're supporting your young man um, through that process. Thank you. But thank, thank you, Dr. So. Thank you to each and every one of you. Um, I know that we have a lot of questions. We wish that we had time to get to all of them. Uh, just know that your question will not go unanswered. Uh, we're submitting questions to our autism response team. Uh, they will be in contact with you to answer those important questions because we know that they are all very, very, very important. Thank you, Dr. Soul, for sharing the information that you just shared. It's about being uh, your authentic self. That's what diversity is, being your authentic self. And so we're so excited uh, about where we are, what we're doing. Um, and just thank you all for joining us on tonight. And we hope again that you will tune in on January 6th for uh, part two of this presentation. And we will continue during that time. So we hope that each of you have a wonderful night. Thank you again for joining us. And you will be receiving an email uh, with the uh, recording from tonight's program. Thank you again to all of our panelists. Have a great night.